So this week in the seminar, we looked at the, a bunch of articles by an historian by the name of Jonathan Saha from the University of Leeds in the UK. I mentioned in the first video that there's this debate about which direction Southeast Asian history is going and where the, if, if the center of research on Southeast Asia is going to sort of move to Southeast Asia itself. If, uh, when it comes to the future, when it comes to the conceptual and methodological approaches, approaches that people are taking towards studying the Southeast Asian past, then the place we need to look for that is not in North America or in Southeast Asia, but in the UK. That is a place where you've got a small group of scholars who are doing some really exciting work. So Jonathan Saha is one of those. And um, I think it's important to note that he comes to his topic of research, which is Burmese history, the history of Burma, um, not from a Southeast Asian history background, but from an imperial uh, a, a British empire background. And even bigger than that, even kind of he's also interested in kind of, uh, you know, connected histories, kind of a larger scale of looking at things. But that world of British imperial history is very rigorous. And the scholars who are, there's just a ton of scholars working on it. They're all, well, not all of them, of course, but many of them are extremely intelligent. And that just raises the bar of what everyone does. So if you come out of that field as a successful scholar, you have got a foundation that you are standing on that is impressive. And that is definitely something that we can see in the scholarship of Jonathan Saha. So we read a whole bunch of his articles. The earlier stuff deals with things like criminality, um, madness, medicine, uh, yeah, the law, things like that. Um, and the one thing that ties it all together is his conceptual or methodological approach. And I'm going to really, really simplify it here. But the gist of it is, is that rather than looking at, uh, you know, a kind of an opposition between the state and, you know, the people that are out there, what Jonathan argues is that the state is essentially what is performed by people. So there's no, there's an idea of a state, but there's no pure form of something that we can identify as a state. Instead, what it is that people, um, you know, encountered or thought of as the state was what they encountered in their daily lives. And that meant going to a court or a hospital um, and encountering all kinds of things from, um, you know, upright um, lawyers to corruption to incompetent doctors to good care. All of this stuff is mixed together. And it's this complex uh, performed uh, actions that are what constitute the state. And this is really important to follow up on because it allows us to look at the past in a more nuanced way rather than seeing, you know, say the state trying to impose uh, medical practices and then seeing that fail when it doesn't happen. Well, of course it's not going to happen because there, this, this is really something uh, you know, that we're, we're imagining should be the case. The reality everywhere is that 
you know, what we experience is what comes to constitute the state for us. And that's what he's looking at. And again, I'm really simplifying that, but uh, that gives you a sense of the direction where he's going. More recently, he's started to look at animals, as animal history is a new field of study that um, is really quite exciting. And again, uh, I think we can put this in the same conceptual pattern of trying to look at animals as, as occupying a kind of middle space. So it's not really the case that the humans are here, the animals are there are the objects, and humans use the animals as tools, but instead there's something in between there. Um, and so, for instance, you know, he looks at elephants in the teak industry in Burma, and the first thing you have to recognize is that if the elephants were not there, then the British would not have been able to exploit, uh, you know, the teak forest the way they could. So just by their mere presence, the elephants already have some kind of agency. But then it's just this, com this complex relationship that he looks at. Uh, where the humans are trying to mold the elephants, but then the demands of the elephants also uh, require the humans to transform, um, you know, their own activities. Um, and he, he comes up with some really great concepts. Um, for instance, Marx talked about um, dead capital. So machinery in a factory is something that you need as a means of production, but it breaks down, you have to keep repairing it, it costs money, it's, it's uh, you know, something that you have to keep investing in, um, but it's necessary. Uh, Jonathan Saha refers to elephants as undead capital because they're like machinery in that you have to keep investing in them to keep them working, but they are actually alive as well, and that has implications. Um, and so, I mean, that's just one example to, uh, that's, uh, we can point to, but there are many ways in which he's connecting his scholarship to all kinds of theoretical works that are out there on conceptions of space, on, you know, um, economics. It's really fascinating stuff. And like I said, um, you know, if we're trying to think about the direction that Southeast Asian history can go, well, in terms of methodology and, um, you know, a kind of a conceptual approach, the path that someone like Jonathan Saha is opening is one that we definitely uh, need to look at. look at. And finally, one last point is one, two, three, I never be your beast of Burma, no. I ain't no teacher.